I'll be in three, two. Hey, it says now we're live streaming. That happened quicker, uh, more quickly than, than, than ever before. Welcome everyone to Science Thursdays. Hugo and Matt, regulars from Coiled here with, with, with Brett Knoll to discuss large scale machine learning for, for, uh, for urban planning. Uh, I'll get Brett to introduce uh, himself and his exciting work at Replica in, in a second, but I'd love you all to introduce yourself in, in the chat as well. What's your interest in what we're talking about today? Perhaps your interest in, in, in Dask uh, uh, as well, uh, and maybe your interest in Coiled. Um, so I also thought just to let you know, if you haven't seen what we do at Coiled, uh, we're building tools uh, to make Dask accessible for everyone, uh, everywhere. Um, at the moment, if you check out our cloud product, which we've just launched, uh, uh, at cloud.coil.io, uh, that'd be fantastic and, and, and give, us, give us feedback. Um, so essentially we're trying to make uh, massively scalable Python environments and, and clusters available to, to everybody. And we'd, we'd love your, your feedback on, on, on all of this. Um, but having said that, without further ado, please introduce yourself in the chat and I'd love to hear a bit about uh, you and what, what you're up to, Brett. Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. Um... So I uh, got started using Dask actually uh, during my postdoc at UC Berkeley. Um, that's where I met Matt. And I was doing uh, machine learning time series computation for astronomy applications back then, a little bit different. Um, now I'm at Replica and we are doing uh, high fidelity mobility and activity simulations of basically what people do in cities, how they interact with infrastructure and the environment. And we use them to help urban planners better understand how people are, you know, interacting with the city and how they can improve people's experience, basically do their job better. Awesome. And of course, there's a lot in your in your tech stack, but you use Dask among other things. Yeah, among Dask, we use other things. I would say that's probably one of the elements that pops up most frequently. Um, but yeah, we are mostly doing stuff in Python, uh, Google Cloud, Cloud Platform, um, little bit of a hodgepodge, but uh, Dask features very centrally in a lot of our model building and uh, all that kind of work. Great. So as Matt is someone who, who has worked on Dask for, for several years, perhaps Matt, you could tell us what Dask is for those um, uninitiated. So there's a joke here. I always defer the uh, this particular question to the guest. So Brett, I'll ask you. But as a bit by way of introduction, Brett actually, as a longtime Dask user, is one of the few people who really know the Dask scheduler decently well. Um, when we first started Coiled, I actually called Brett and said, hey, Brett, do you want to either work for Coiled or be a Coiled customer? And he chose to, uh, he chose to defer. Um, <laughs> but uh, Brett can probably answer the what is Dask question in far more depth than, than he needs to. But maybe you oh, can give dear. a quick summary here, Brett. I knew this question was coming, and I forgot to prepare for it. So I hope I don't Perfect. say anything embarrassing. Uh, and what's it to, to me, you as well? Because it's, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, to me personally, subjectively, I can't be wrong. Um, Dask is a Python library that lets you very simply parallelize arbitrary Python workflows. And it also comes with, I would say, a sort of set of recipes for very common kind of parallel computing tasks like uh, high dimensional arrays, data frames, things like that. That's a pretty solid answer. Yeah, I like that. Um, well, I'd love to jump into what you're thinking about and, and, and what you're doing at the moment, Brett. Yeah, sure, that'd be great. Um, so just to start, I'm gonna show, uh, I'll share my screen real quick. Um, I'm going to just give a really, really brief overview of kind of what our tool provides. Um, so this, if I zoom out a little bit, you can see, uh, this is a representation of our Kansas City model. Um, and basically what you see here is for the 2 million people who live in the greater Kansas City area, we have a representation of on a typical day, Thursday, uh, in a given season, basically just what did people do? Where did they go? How did they get there? Um, so for example, if I am an urban planner and I'm thinking about adding a toll to I-35, um, probably a very unpopular move if I had to guess, but <laughs> I'm gonna do it anyway, I'm feeling brave. Um, I might wanna know, okay, on this stretch where I'm planning on adding a toll, who are the people who are most likely to be affected and have to pay for it? So here I clicked on this segment, we see that there are 62,000 trips per day made by 48,000 people. And I can get 
through this UI kind of basic summary information about, for example, this is uh, different cities where people live. So kind of intuitively, you see a lot of commuters coming from the Southwest part of the region. Um, maybe I also, you know, only care about work trips. I can filter to that. And, you know, if I'm interested in kind of providing an equitable um, outcome, I might also want to say, what's the household income distribution of the people who are going to be affected by this toll? And here we might say, I'm not an urban planner, so I won't make any kind of actual judgments, but we might say, this is more low income people than I expected. So I'm going to revisit this and try to think of another way that I might solve my revenue needs or, or something like that. So that's just kind of a very, very basic overview of, of what we're doing. And everything I'm going to walk through going forward is basically describing one of the inputs to this ultimate model or the kind of overall simulation loop that we run through at the very end um, where we actually generate these activities for our, our population. Awesome, thanks Brett. So we have a, a question in the chat from Draw, which is related to a question I have. Draw's question is, is all this real collected data from phones or something? And my question was, how do you think about privacy when, when, when generating, building this product? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, the answer is no, it is not real data. It is all synthetic simulated data. Um, and for us, privacy is a really big concern. And I think for urban planners in general, there's this kind of difficult trade-off to navigate where there are data sets available that give you exact locations of real people and you can use them to make some pretty insightful uh, judgments about what's going on in your city. But the privacy implications of that are, are kind of, let's say, dicey maybe. Um, so our model instead, and that actually segues pretty well to what I was going to discuss next, is we, uh, all of our data is, comes out of models. So we ingest a wide variety of data sources. We train machine learning models to predict what might real people do. And then the predictions from those models are what feed this final uh, output, the UI and the, you know, the various different kinds of reports that we generate. So no actual trips made by real people are represented in our data. And we think that that's a big selling point actually of, of how we do things. The fact that there's this kind of additional layer of obfuscation, but that we hope doesn't Im impact the accuracy, the quality of the results at all. Great. And I just realized, is it, did this particular quality of your work um, inspire the name Replica? <laughs> Um, that's actually a good question. I, so I don't think we mentioned before, but uh, Replica spun out originally of Sidewalk Labs, which is mm -hmm. uh, an alphabet company also working in the urban planning space. And I should have a better answer for this, but uh, it, it predates my, my time at Sidewalk Labs. So I don't know for sure. Um, but I, but uh, yeah, for sure, the idea is that it's not the actual real behaviors of people, which like I said, would be not something that you want to just broadcast on the internet, yep. but it's something in a kind of indistinguishable facsimile, I guess you could say. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. And I, you, you mentioned even from a few data points, there can be a lot of privacy concerns and there's, you're aware of this, but for pe people out there, the New York Times Privacy Project has a lot of interesting stuff on, on, on this um, and a lot of deep dives into these, these types of things. The other thing before we move on, Brett, just want to thank you for saying alphabet and not Google. I mean, I, probably because you worked at Cyborg, that's why you did it, but you're one of the first people in a long time I've heard, heard referred to as Alphabet, so that's cool. I should have snuck in and just called it Google just to mess with them a little bit. Yeah. Missed my opportunity. Awesome. All right, um, well, let's, let's jump in. This is exciting. Okay, yeah, so I've got this um, kind of diagram here. I'm not gonna go into any of the details, but um, I wanted to touch uh, on one kind of early, part of this pipeline, um, which we call uh, the synthetic population. So I mentioned that the activities that we generate, they are not associated with any real people that you could identify. So you're not in the data. And the way that we achieve this is we pull a bunch of data from various data sources, mostly the US census, that tell us kind of aggregate information about people in a given uh, county, tract, whatever. Um, 
what does the distribution of different characteristics look like? So what's the distribution of ages, of incomes, what percentage of people own their homes and their own a vehicle, things like that. Um, we also are able to source from the census uh, what's called, I think it's public use microdata samples, POOMs, um, which are actual individual records from real households. So these carry a lot of very fine grained information about what's going on in the population. Um, and what we do is we build these models. You can see these little diagrams here. Uh, simply, they're just, uh, they're uh, Bayesian networks is the kind of term, but if you're not familiar with that, they're just a, a representation of the relationships between variables in a data set. So we train these models and we try to combine those two aggregate and disaggregate data sources to get a representation of you know, what these demographic variables look like and how they're correlated and kind of what that structure looks like. Um, so we're going to, in the end, pull out one record per actual person who lives in an area, but no single person is like one-to-one -one mapped in the data. So it's a kind of statistically along any set of dimensions that you might slice, indistinguishable representation of the real population but no specific individuals are able to be re-identified. So that's kind of the, the jumping off point of our like privacy preserving uh, modeling process. Um, so I was just gonna show quickly an example of how we use DASK to take this process, which um, was not designed with DASK in mind. Uh, it's using a graphical modeling library called Pomegranate, uh, which is open source Python. Um, and we have our own open source library called Doppelganger that wraps it. Um, I'm not gonna walk through this detail in example because it's a bit long, but you can see some of the same kind of pictures that I was showing before. We're basically just trying to learn the correlation structure between these variables using census data as inputs. So uh, this is just a little bit of like boilerplate, pull some data from the census. I'm not gonna walk through it in too much detail, but you can see here, these columns represent different um, census areas, um, we, we can call them census tracts. What's the total number of households? What's the total number of households with one person? Um, lots and lots of different columns that are hidden here, um, describing all of the different kind of marginal distributions. And again, this is all being pulled from the publicly available free US census data. So we are pulling all of this information. And then I I'm just gonna show a really, really simple, a lot of this code is kind of hidden away in this doppelganger library and I don't wanna walk through it, but the important thing to know is just, this is a serial function. It doesn't know anything about Dask. And in order to parallelize it, we pretty much just take the list of these, uh, you can see Puma is the, uh, the kind of geo identifier that we're gonna loop over. So, I ran it for one specific Puma here just to see an example of what kind of output we're getting. Um, this is just a pomegranate Bayesian network model. Um, so we have a couple of these. I think the rendering is not too good in the notebook here, but um, basically no Dask stuff involved in any of the modeling code. And then if I want to parallelize this, then I can just start my cluster and I can take this function generate models, which I ran up here for a single Puma and I can loop over all of the different Pumas in the data set, submit a generate models function for each one. And if I pop over to my DAS scheduler, you'll see this is just 14 models. I picked a very small uh, subset because I'm running on my laptop right now. Um, but in theory, we can parallelize this to 330 million people in the whole US. And for every single census tract, build this network representation, which is a, a fairly sophisticated, uh, heavy-ish weight model um, for every single one. And right now I'm running this on my laptop, but we can scale it out to a Kubernetes cluster with as many workers as we want with pretty much no additional work. So here you can see a couple are, are finishing up. Um, and yeah, that was really all that it took from a DASC perspective. I kind of mocked out the last bit, but um, the way that we get our final result from these models is we would submit one more function that says generate a bunch of samples, basically like a CSV kind of record style 
representation of all of the people in a given neighborhood. And we would loop over that. We could combine them into a Dask data frame or some kind of collection. We can write them to a database or to cloud storage or, or what have you. Fantastic, Brett. And it's all of this, of course, that informs the, the product um, for urban planners that you, you showed us originally. Um, yeah, and this, this is kind of the like the groundwork. So this isn't actually describing anything about how people travel, mm -hmm. but it is giving a bunch of important context for when we run our simulation and we have all of these agents moving around the city. It lets you then go back and say, okay, well, for the people who ended up taking this bus, what was the distribution of household incomes? And you kind of need to start with some representation of who is using the infrastructure before you can then move on to what are they going to do with it? Great. So we have a question from Draw, um, and it, it sounds like he, he has some insider knowledge or he has a bit more, bit more context. So I'll ask, he, Draw writes, if this is from ACS and it's for tracks, then it has to be five year averages. So I'm, I'm not certain how that logic quite works, but you probably have a sense, does this affect the simulation, Draw asks. Um, that's also a very good uh, detailed question. It sounds like he probably knows more than I do um, since I, like I'm going to keep uh, adding this disclaimer that this is not precisely my field. I do more of the data engineering stuff. So uh, happy to put you in touch with some of our research and development team if you're interested in like the nitty gritty. Um, but in some cases we use the five-year averages in some cases, we use the most recent year vintage. I know there are some kind of drawbacks of using the most recent data because it tends to be from a smaller sample size. So I guess it's kind of a bias variance type thing to put it in language that I'm a little more familiar with. Um, but again, all we're trying to do here is we're just trying to get the number of people who live in each part of town. And we're trying to get a, a rough overview of what their demographic characteristics look like. So it's it's true that there are some kind of uh, time, obviously the census is not real time updating. And one of the things that we're trying to do is give a view of a city as it's happening, you know, right now or very recently. So we do need to do a little bit of kind of uh, forward projection and things like that, um, that I'm kind of glossing over right now. This is really just focusing on like the kind of census disaggregation part of this this slightly longer pipeline that I've glossed over. Cool, thanks for that, Brett. And thanks for the great question, Draw. Um, and thank you, Brett, for mentioning that you work on, on the data engineering stuff as well, because I, I just want to give a teaser, something we hope to get to is seeing your, your prefect and Dask workflow combined here, which is, which is pretty exciting. Um, but I think probably we can move on to the next section now. The next thing you wanted to show, um, as, as you bring up that on your screen, I just wanted to let everyone know that if you're interested in learning, learning more about Dask, we, um, we, of course, we build products for uh, scalable Python computing, but we run, run workshops uh, uh, as well. And I'm going to post a link to uh, a, a training later in October that, that we're running, uh, the Coiled team. Um, so experts in, in Dask, I'm going to put a little code in, which gives a 20% off uh, discount. So feel free to share this, share this with friends. And if you want to come in uh, and learn Dask with us, that would, that would also be cool. So, um, Good sneaking in the sales there work, work there. Hugo. Exactly. Ad break, ad break, <laughs> uh, over, um, seven second ad break. Great. Um, all right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the kind of, maybe I should have, uh, led off with this, but sort of the unifying theme with respect to Dask of everything that I'm talking about is all of it kind of comes from a non-DASC like uh, origination. So everything has some sort of, uh, you know, either we, we were already doing this before we were using DASC and we needed a way to parallelize it or, um, you know, they just happen to fit together well. But uh, in each of these cases, I'm kind of minimally using like the built-in DASC functionality. We do use that a lot for kind of data science exploration stuff like Dask data frame. I use it every single day, but um, I'm trying to give a view of kind of non-Dask use cases uh, within our company that just naturally like dovetail with the kind of Dask stack. You're sprinkling in Dask. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's just a light sprinkling, exactly. Perfect. Um, okay, so the next kind of motivating example that I'm gonna walk through is now that we have this representation of where all of our people live. And I didn't go into it, but we also talk 
we also uh, do some modeling for trying to guess where the people are most likely to work, since that's a big factor, obviously, in, in modeling where people go. Um, a very key element of making the modeling decisions about what people are going to do is figuring out how long people's commutes are and what kind of infrastructure they're most likely to take when they go from one place to another. So what I'm showing here is an open source uh, routing library called Graphhopper, uh, which is actually a Java library. Um, it uses OpenStreetMap data and a lot like Google Maps, it just serves these requests. This is running locally um, on my laptop, but for any given origin destination, you can get walking, biking, driving. You can actually do transit too, but uh, I didn't build this version with, with transit. Um, so we use this as an ingredient in a lot of our models. We want to take all of the people in a region that we simulated in the previous step, and we want to know what does their commute look like. So I'm here loading just a little snippet, a subset of people from, this is actually Lincoln, Nebraska now, which is where we use as kind of a test region because it's big enough to have transit, but also still small enough to fit on your laptop. Um, so this here is just a little subset of people. I'm taking the people who have work locations. Um, this, oops, went away. Uh, this is a biz library that we use a lot called Kepler. Um, it's open source out of Uber. It's not very happy with my uh, running on this cluster right now, but don't let that scare you away. It's very useful, very handy for kind of looking at uh, geospatial information. Um, so basically we're taking all of these home and work locations and I just want to ask Graphhopper, in this case, what's the driving distance from point A to point B for every single one? So this is another kind of embarrassingly parallel use case. Um, and I mentioned that this is running in Java. It's not a Python router. So it's actually going to be making a JSON web request. Um, so here I just have my little function. I've connected to a Graphhopper instance. Um, this is all actually running in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, I won't get, go too much into detail about how we do that, but I think there's a lot of people using Kubernetes and Dask together. Uh, you guys can probably attest to that uh, a little bit more, but um, we're using Helm to deploy these clusters. So each time I want to run a job, I spin up a new Helm release. It has a Dask scheduler, Dask workers, and then it has all of these other web services running in it. In this case, it's a router. In some other cases, it's uh, geospatial index kind of web services, things like that. So I'm just going to, as a really simple example, load up uh, one person, ask for directions. So you can see I'm getting back this like crazy JSON payload that actually has the list of all of the network links that the person traverses when they go from point A to point B. But I don't care about that. I'm just going to take the distance. I'm going to return that from my function. And I'm just going to apply this function over my Dask data frame. So it's just persons.apply get driving distance and hopefully. So I'm curious in this case, like why even use Dask, right? Like you, all the computation is happening on these other Java servers somewhere, right? Like why can't you make a thousand web requests? Um, yeah, why Dask in this case? Oh, you, you certainly can. And if this was the only thing that we were going to use Dask for, then we wouldn't use Dask. Um, right. yeah. You could do you this. And... Yeah, you could do this with a thread pool. But like my at this point, my preferred way to spin up a thread pool is to use a, a Dask distributed scheduler because <laughs> it's just easy. You know, it's, it's very little work. Um, huh, so this actually completed already. I'm, maybe I'm on the wrong uh, tab or something, but it, probably everyone's seen the Dask scheduler dashboard before. You know, uh, you know what it looks like. Um, this is against really think too many Dask clusters. Is my is my perception here? Yeah. And, well, and one uh, maybe this is a, a little uh, product idea for you guys. I'm just going to throw it out there. But I have a lot of issues viewing the Dask scheduler dashboard. <clears throat> excuse me. Mm -hmm. Over Kubernetes port forward, it's very mm -hmm. flaky, and I'm always losing my connection. So that also could be what happened here. Um, just a, something to consider. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Coil does have a proxy for exactly this reason. Um, well, I, I, I didn't know that. I, I don't know why I'm not already a customer. That's a good. You're on GCP. 
GCP support is, is taking a while. If you want to take your Alphabet spinoff company and move to AWS for a few months, <laughs> support, that'll work out just fine. I feel like we should keep them on their toes and at least like leave the possibility <laughs> open. So yeah, I don't know exactly what happened um, with my dashboard, but as you can see, I got back all of my results. For each person in my input data frame, I now have this distance. And in this case, I'm just kind of doing you know, interactive data science stuff. I want to look at the distribution and I want to say, does this match my intuition? And does this explain something that I found in, in one of my models or my simulation output or, or something like that, right? This is, that's all of the kind of notebook stuff I'm going through right now is really just like data exploration. Um, but in production, when we're going to train a model using this information, um, that's the part that makes use of prefect. So uh, you can see here, these are all different kind of pre-processing steps in our pipeline. Um, I started this job earlier and then I realized it was, it's kind of expensive. So I decided to cancel it. Um, but this step here is basically what I'm describing right now. Give me the commute summary statistics for everyone who lives in a region. Um, and you can see it's downstream of this population prefect task, um, which was basically the last notebook I was showing you, give me all of the people who live in this region. And prefect gives us a very nice way to kind of using all the same DASK uh, infrastructure tooling, um, do this kind of workflow management orchestration stuff. And we actually, before we were using prefect, I just wrote my own version of all this kind of DAG uh, dependency tracking stuff with DASK mm -hmm. delayed. And it wasn't too bad, but I definitely did a worse job than, yeah. than Prefect. Like my hand rolled Prefect was worse. So uh, it was definitely a relief to find that someone had very thoughtfully designed uh, the same kind of tool that I was I mean, it was, a relief, it was a relief for the DAS developers too. I think you had issues about you know, asking for retries to support and other things we just like didn't really get, get around to. And when Prefect did get around to all those things, we said, great, we can stop thinking about these feature requests. Prefect has it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's been very, very nice. Um, and a particularly nice thing about this kind of pattern is, so I showed you here, this is doing a Dask data frame load and it's applying a function, right? So you're not gonna see that kind of specific, like very granular stuff in this prefect view. Um, but under the hood, what this uh, commute data task is doing is it's connecting to the same Dask client using a worker mm -hmm. client that's already running my prefect flow. So I just have one Dask cluster that's responsible for all of this stuff. And when I need to spin up a bunch more workers and do some very, very heavyweight task, I, it just happens naturally for me. And Dask, Dask Adaptive um, can kind of handle some of that scaling up and down uh, for us. So just to make sure I got, I got this right, you've got one prefect flow, which has many tasks within it. Yes. Each of those tasks might itself create some other Dask stuff. And all of those things are all going to be running on the same Dask cluster set up with Helm Kubernetes that'll auto scale up and down based on need. Yeah, the auto scaling, we we run into some issues mostly with, um, I mentioned that we were using Helm. Yeah, the Helm. And great. you can go up very easily, no problem. <laughs> but going back down is is quite a bit dicier. So uh, if anyone has any suggestions, please please let me know. Um, Don't use Helm, but, uh, I think is the answer. Probably that is the answer, yeah. But it, it does make it very convenient to do all this other kind of yeah. stuff. When we have a cluster with a lot of different services, Helm is really nice. But the Dask support is probably the worst possible way that we could deploy Dask. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag overall. Um, Kubernetes is great but, for stateless services. Dask is right. stateful. And so there's like a little bit of a, a mixture that's off. off. Exactly, yeah. Um, but the, the one other thing I just wanted to point out is a lot of these tasks in here, I'm not going to go through all of them, but many of them are very lightweight and there's no, there's no Dask. They don't know about Dask at all. They mm -hmm. just run a Python function. Um, that's a, a prefect task. And it's only when I have a function in here that's like, okay, this needs to be parallelized across a few hundred workers. Then it's free to 
kind of go back to the main scheduler and say, hey, I, I need, you know, my own kind of budget of workers and submit tasks to the same queue and Dask just figures it all out pretty nicely for us. That's awesome. Okay, um, so I have one other uh, example that I'm going to walk through moving on from this kind of routing example. And I hope this isn't too specific to GCP folks, um, since you guys apparently are not there yet. Um, I'm sure there's very, very similar stuff you can do on, on AWS. You're just, you're just pushing us towards GCP, which is great. Plus, this isn't, this isn't just a coil specific thing. Most people who come on this live stream aren't coil users, they're Dask users. So you're well within, well within bounds. OK, perfect. Good to know. Um, so I just wanted to show what I think is kind of an interesting and somewhat novel uh, interaction between this is Google BigQuery and Dask. So mm -hmm. we love Google BigQuery. We use it for all sorts of kind of data warehouse, large scale data processing problems. And there's a certain set of functionality that it's very, very good at. And the Dask either doesn't try to do or kind of does, but maybe isn't as specialized in that kind of thing. And then there are a lot of things that, you know, like training these kinds of complicated models, calling out to web services, stuff like that, that BigQuery obviously is not well suited for. So we've spent a lot of time investing in our kind of uh, interface layer between BigQuery and Dask. And I think it's probably at a point where it would be useful for, for others. Um, there's this GitHub issue um, that has gone on for quite a while about BigQuery Dask support. And uh, Tim Swast at Google pitched in quite a bit, gave us a lot of good ideas. And we basically have a kind of connector now that lets us run a query in BigQuery and pull the results out using the BigQuery storage API, which is using uh, arrow format to do the mm -hmm. communication. Um, pull that into a partitioned desk data frame, do our do modeling stuff to each partition, and then do whatever we want, just like we would with a regular DAS data frame with the output. We can write it back to BigQuery, we can write it to CSVs, to cloud storage, um, anything like that. So to be clear, you're making a Google, you're making a query on Google BigQuery where the result set is actually quite large. You can't bring this down into Pandas data frame. The results are themselves distributed. Yes, yes, um, that's exactly right. Because there's already perfectly fine tooling for loading a pandas data frame from BigQuery. That's a pretty well studied problem. Um, Google has their own library for doing it. It's it's you know quite convenient, and there's even an IPython magic for doing it. So that's all very very straightforward. Um, in this case, what I was going to show is we have this table. This is again just for Lincoln. Um, so this is some mobile location data that we're going to train models on and then pair with our synthetic population in order to make predictions about what the people in our population are going to do. So this is 50 gigabytes of data. Uh, the full data set for the US is large. I, I don't really know how large, but uh, it's certainly not going to fit on your laptop. So uh, one of the use cases that we found BigQuery is really, really good at is doing these large scale distributed shuffles um, shuffle in this case, just meaning we want to group by some key and we want to aggregate all the data for that key um, on a specific node. So in a DAS data frame, this would be accomplished with set index with a certain column, in this case, set index UID, if I was going to pull the full thing out. Mm -hmm. And it, it works in Dask, it's, you know, it, it's totally serviceable, but we've just found that using BigQuery for this and being able to kind of get their unlimited scaling and not have to worry about, you know, did I leave 10,000 machines running or whatever, um, which again, maybe is a coil problem. But for us as GCP people, we're on our own. Um, so farming this out to BigQuery just makes the most sense for us uh, at this stage. So uh, I'm going to show a quick notebook. Um, this aggregation is grabbing each device ID and it's getting all of the data for that device in a single record. Um, so it's maybe a little bit strange to people who are not used to like nested and repeated fields. In BigQuery, it's, it's very normal, um, but for other kind of SQL patterns, it might be unusual. So here I have that same query that I ran. And basically the way our 
pipeline works is we execute this query, we store the result in a temp table, and I have this helper, GBQ as Dask DF. I've posted a version a while ago on this GitHub issue. I don't know if you guys can link to it or something. It might be interesting to people or, oh, oops, I, I unshared my screen. My thing was too big. Um, hopefully I'm, I'm back now. You are. But, uh, very, very eager to get people's feedback on and this. If you share the link with me in, in the Zoom chat, I can actually then share it in, in, in the YouTube chat. Perfect. I definitely know how to use the Zoom chat. I can, I can handle it. So, issue number 3121. Three, three, one. I can okay, handle it. Three, one, two, one. Okay, Matt's on top of it. Yeah, me. Matt just knew the issue number off the top of his head. So. No, you got it on your, on your screen. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not that good. Um, okay, so basically, there's, it looks a little bit more complicated than it is. This is just sort of bookkeeping. Um, but really, we just have this function read rows arrow. I mentioned we're pulling the data out from BigQuery using the arrow format, um, which is something that it natively supports. And we basically just wrap that in a Dask delayed decorator. And for we ask BigQuery to export all of the shards of our query result. We execute that function for every single shard. And that result comes out kind of naturally parallelized across all of our different workers. Um, it took a little bit of, I don't want to say complicated, but slightly tricky bookkeeping because there's a lot of um, gRPC and uh, protocol buffer kind of stuff going on in a lot of these Google libraries. And as far as I know, Dask does not play very well with uh, like pickling, serializing, some of those kind of objects. Maybe I'm, my information is out of date, but often I've found that the Google tools and other open source tools, including Dask, don't necessarily play that well together. So I was very relieved to, to find a solution that did actually work. Yeah, I mean, if I were to maybe uh, alter that statement, I would say that the Google tools don't support common standards like pickling, uh, while the community tools do. Uh, yeah, but that's much better, much better said, yeah. yeah. Uh, fortunately, it's nice. It's actually really awesome seeing tools like Google BigQuery take on standards like Arrow which yeah. allow for these sorts of unanticipated connections. Yeah, right. yeah. That, I mean, the fact the the advent of this arrow export capability was was huge for us in being able to use BigQuery for all sorts of new cases. And it, I don't know, not to tell Google like what to do, but it, it just seems like an obvious good idea for them to support as many of these things as possible because all of a sudden I can use it and I couldn't before. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been great for me. Um, one other thing I'll just like little BigQuery detail that I'll throw in is um, BigQuery has this notion of partitioning where if you have a, a table with a timestamp field, you can kind of under the hood in a way that they'll take care of for you, um, separate the table into many small tables and you only pay to access data for a, a single time slice that you're going to query against. So in our case, we have many years of like longitudinal data and sometimes you only want data for one day. So there's also a kind of nice uh, interaction here that we've we've baked in where we get the same kind of uh, both query performance and uh, cost efficiency of using this partitioning key um, alongside our Dask BigQuery helper. Just a little, little detail I wanted to throw in because I'm, I'm kind of proud of it. Um, so I'll just show really quickly like what the output looks like. Um, this is what the original query result looks like. So you see the exact same thing here. This is just the Dask data frame form. Um, and even though these are called lat long timestamp, if you look at the actual results, just like in the query, each one of these is actually a NumPy array of lats, longs, or timestamps. Um, so it's a little bit of a weird format to get back. Um, but thankfully, with, with Arrow, it's no problem. Um, I don't know if people use Avro very much for this kind of thing, but Avro also supports this nested format, but everything is just uh, like list, a Python list of objects or whatever. So the performance is, is kind of terrible. Um, but using the arrow format, we've, we've found that it's, it's no problem at all to serialize, ship, deserialize these quite large um, NumPy arrays. 
in this in this nested form that for BigQuery is like very natural, but in pandas, I don't know, it kind of, at least for me, the first time I look at this, I'm like, wait, what, did something go go wrong here with this with a group by? That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so in this case, the the kind of simple model that we are going to do first is we take all this mobile location data and we want to transform it into a kind of more parsimonious, more interesting representation of just where people went. So we don't care that you were here at 901, 902, 903. We just want to know you went from here to here at this time. So we call that state points rather than traces, which are individual location pings. Um, so this is like a really simple, it, I'm not showing the actual clustering function, but you can kind of imagine how it works. You detect movement, you filter that out, and then you cluster together points that are nearby. Um, so here is a, another little Kepler map of what the kind of output of this looks like. So you'll see, we see this device show up. Um, this is one cluster that we've identified. Um, the dot is moving around as the person travels. Um, so this is the kind of state point aggregated form that we're getting out is what location you were at from when to when. Uh, and so to do this with our kind of nested format, all we do is this dash data frame dot ply. Again, each row in the previous case is actually a whole bunch of records that are nested. So we're just applying that cluster function to each row of our input. Um, not sure if I'm still going to have problems with my, my dashboard. Yeah, in this case, it's actually going to be OK. And I, I showed that this was way too much data to load on my laptop. So if we stayed here for a while, you would just see my bars all fill up, and then my Zoom call would probably crash. But I'm going to try and uh, head that off. that will be a great mic drop at the end of a demo, just crash. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's a little cooler if you actually succeed in your computation rather than fail. But oh I no! But I mean, you succeed, but then Zoom fails. <laughs> but then Zoom fails, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, the last thing I'll mention here is we still, I would say, don't have a great solution for going back to BigQuery, but we have a pretty good one, which is BigQuery. For some reason that someone at Google knows, will not let you export to Parquet format, but it will import from Parquet format. And we use Parquet as our kind of preferred storage medium for all of our large Dask data frame kind of collections. Um, so in this case, we, in order to write back to BigQuery, like the result of some kind of, say, clustering like this, um, we just write everything to cloud storage as intermediate Parquet files and then have BigQuery slurp it all back up. It feels somehow slightly inefficient, but Cloud storage is just, you, you basically can't break Google Cloud Storage. So uh, it's kind of nice to just throw it all out there and have it be their problem. It sounds like a challenge, Brad. Oh, yeah. actually, I probably shouldn't have said that because we've definitely broken it in some kinds of ways. But uh, this kind of thing is not what breaks it. Cool. Great. Well, thank you so much for this, this demo. We're actually, we're, we're ahead of time, which is there's an irony that we thought we, there was so much we wanted to cover today that Matt and I decided to to keep our lips sealed more than we would would otherwise. Um, you guys spooked me. I thought I had to that I had to blitz through. Yeah, I mean, you know, who knows what happens on Science Thursdays? It's always it's always a lucky bit. But this has been in, in, incredibly <laughs> in, in, informative. I um before wrap it, we'll wrap up a bit early, which will allow us to spend a bit more time in in, in Gather Town. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Um, afterwards, we use a tool called GatherTown where we can vi all video chat and walk around and in this case, an urban space. We're going to Times Square today um, in, in order to, to hang out a bit and, and have a conversation. So I'll post that link in the, in, in, in the chat here. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, uh, Brett, whether there was a, a, any final thoughts you had or p ways people can get involved if they'd like to you know, learn more about, about this type of stuff. Let me jump in just briefly first. So what I really like about this example is that it's, you know, four different examples that are, you know, some of them are kind of similar. It's, you know, embarrassingly parallel stuff. You got some prefect, you got some Google BigQuery uh, connections, but this is, you've, you've found a variety of ways of using Dask to solve a variety of problems, all of which were necessary to solve your end goal of, you know, understanding urban transit. Um, and it shows how much uh, 
how many small problems you need to solve to solve a big problem. And it's sort of fun to see, as we sort of see in large organizations, Dask is sort of sprinkled in in lots of different kinds of places. And it's fun seeing a tool get sort of coerced in different ways. I think Brett is uniquely able or particularly able to, to coerce Dask. So it's fun seeing how, uh, it's fun seeing the things that you do, right? Like you needed to get data out of Google BigQuery to do things. You found a way to do that. It wasn't that hard for you and you like, you know, made this nice functionality. You wanted to, you know, run things in production. So you run in Prefect. And there's like this nice stuff there. It's just sort of, I think I really love the variety of this presentation. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always a fun kind of challenge trying to figure out how to scale all of these um, models and data processing problems that we encounter to the full United States, um, 330 million people. So anything that has a 330 million in the kind of set of multipliers um, could, could kind of get you in trouble if, uh, if you're not careful. Um, and, and so we we do pretty much always, I would say, for for all but the very simplest problems, always turn to either Dask or BigQuery um, for for scaling things out. And uh, the nice thing about Dask is, oftentimes we start with a prototype that doesn't parallelize at all. Um, we're just trying to get something that's kind of a you know research proof of concept going, and Dask has historically for us made it very easy to take these uh, initial implementations and scale them and make them performant and not have to invent a whole new, you know, build a whole new uh, web service for every single kind of computation task that we want. We just sort of take the Python code that we already wrote. Maybe we do a little bit of, you know, Dask data frame kind of magic to it. But in many cases, it's just as simple as take the function that you wanted to run and just submit it um, 10,000 times and then wait for the results. Easy peasy. OK, great. Exactly. Well, thank you once again, Brad. Yeah. Sorry, go on, Matt. Back to you's question. Is there anything that you want to leave uh, watchers with? Links to go to, maybe if they're interested in replicas or something they can play with? What's How should we get involved? That's a good question. I, I don't know if. Uh, our, I'm sure I'm allowed to say this probably. I always get nervous because um, I'm not exactly like the communications guy, but uh, we do have an exciting new website that I would love to point people to. Um, but I don't know for sure if it's live yet. Let's just go and see. It is. Oh, it's awesome. beautiful. Um, so yeah, we're at replicahq.com. Um, people can feel free to email me with follow-up questions, brett at replicahq.com. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I've got, though. Great. Fantastic. Well, thank you once again, Brett. Brett. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Hugo. Thanks, Coiled. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today. This has been, this has been really like a, a new type of, of seeing Dask, Dask in action. We, we haven't had one on, on urban planning before, so that, that was really, really exciting. Um, and we'll all gather in, in, in Gathertown. I'll put the link there uh, as well to have, have a chat and see what you all are up to. Um, 